uh, 10 years and three months ago, I started asking um, the question, how do you solve the housing crisis? I mean, very naive question. And uh, it's taken me 10 years to find an answer to that, but I'm very satisfied with the answer, and now I'm ready to leave this as a body of work for the minute. I will return to it in a number of years. I'm afraid I can't give more uh, details right now because we're short on time. Uh, we're always very short on time. We have no time. Uh, even capitalism is late, and we run the risk ourselves if we don't move uh, forward of, uh, of b being the same. So you, you, I ask you to just accept this uh, statement without really asking too many questions about it. My, my life work is to create a viable mainstream alternative to the mortgage-backed home. It's not performative. This is what I'm really trying to do with my life as a temporal object. Um, before I tell you what the, I, I believe the solution to the housing crisis is, I want to flag some things that it's not. Um, the, the first thing is that the solution to the housing crisis is not cooperatives. Um, they've been around for 150 years. There are less than 5,000 units in the UK. We're hundreds of thousands uh, of homes short. If they were a viable alternative to the mortgage, they would have succeeded by now. Um, it's, it's not crypto or uh, fractional ownership or uh, blockchain-inspired uh, financial solutions. Um, they do not carry the market cap of the mortgage and are not competitive with it. The solution is not caravans, by which I mean not just like van life, but I also mean uh, all forms of uh, uh, states of exception. So, you know, um, specific loopholes or uh, highly uh, conditional deals based on personal relationships, etc. They're, they're not, they're not uh, a main, mainstream. It's also not prefab, uh, volumetric. Um, or any other type of uh, a flat pack or, or accelerated design. Um, of course, the building industry does need uh, uh, improvement. It's one of the most archaic industries that exist. But all, all movement in this uh, sphere just increases the margin of the developer. It doesn't increase the supply. Uh, and of course, the solution is not politics. I mean, no one could really believe that this man has any ideas. So uh, the, the thing that I do want to say, though, is that if, you're, if your goal is to find an alternative to the mortgage, what I discovered is that there are no solutions to the housing crisis from within the structure of late capitalism itself, which means that to solve the housing crisis necessarily means destroying capitalist property relations. Uh, why, why is that the case? Well, I say that because social injustice and wealth inequality are not uh, flaws of the capitalist property system, but as I'm sure we're all aware, they are design features. Um, and, and so I think the, the question there is one which I, I very rarely hear actually anyone, in fact, I've never heard anyone really speak about it publicly. There's no um, popular book on the subject, and there's not even really very much academic literature on the history of the mortgage, which is something of great interest to me. Um, it dates back to very specific, I mean, of course, mortgages have existed for several uh, hundreds of years, but the modern mortgage, the 30-year mortgage, um, is an invention of the United States of America, and it's more or less a, a project of uh, Thomas Jefferson. Um, he recognizes in the early years of the republic that they suffer from a number of problems. The first is they have uh, hostile, hostile empires or, or imperial uh, forces, the Spanish, the French, the British. They don't have enough, they don't have any money, so they can't really sustain an army or a police force, and they're not quite sure how to achieve territorial sovereignty and um, uh, uh, solidify their territorial holdings. So Jefferson comes up with the idea of every citizen being a lethally armed um, small property holder. Uh, so he, he goes about, first of all, creating the Land Ordinance uh, Act of 1785, which, as you're probably familiar, divides the entire continental United States into one-mile grids. Um, he's a, a driving force of the Second Amendment in 1791, which gives uh, uh, every landholder the right to protect their property with lethal force. And, of course, he was uh, one of the main um, initiators, along with Hamilton, of the First Bank of the United States in the same year, who, which only had one public product, the, uh, which was the mortgage, the 30-year mortgage. And basically what they thought was, initially they started giving land away. And then they realized that actually this is the only thing we've got which is of any value. We shouldn't give it away. So how do we give it away? You know, no one has any money, so they can't buy it from us. So how are we going to do that? So they set up the First Bank of the United States specifically to create the mortgage. Um, and the purpose of that then is that they do auctions of land and the citizens buy them on 100% mortgages and pay them back. So this becomes a revenue stream for the, for, for the early United States. Uh, of course, this uh, design of the mortgage is the specifics of how it functions is specifically designed in order to only function in an expanding territory. That's why it exists. 
Um, so, of course, it's central to the frontier wars, not just uh, defeating their uh, colonial uh, adversaries, but also expropriating land from Native Americans. Uh, and, of course, it culminates in the Homestead Act in 1862, which is, uh, I think you could probably say, the sort of um, conclusion of uh, the settler colonial project, which is the United States. Um, of course, they refer to this as manifest destiny, as a kind of extreme ideology around settler colonialism in the US, uh, which we sometimes overlook. But essentially, the mortgage is a tool of settler colonialism, which means that if you want to destroy the mortgage, you're also wanting to end capitalist modernity, which from my perspective is not a bad thing. In condition, what happens when the, when the territory is fixed? Well, weirdly, um, you get a complete reversal of how the system works, and it flips and generates structural shortage. Essentially, what happens is uh, homeowners, uh, they don't own their home. They buy a uh, lifetime of debt, and uh, that becomes their main asset. Of course, their, their, their pension, their intergenerational wealth, the entire future of their family is tied up in this property, which means it can never go down in value. And anyone who has a mortgage is very concerned about the depreciation of their house. So even if you're uh, you know, a labor voter or a left-wing voter, you will always vote for a politician who will prevent the production of new supply. Because uh, as I think uh, this sl slide, which should have come a little earlier, this is the only kind of economic principle you need in this presentation, which is supply and demand uh, metric. Obviously, infinite supply uh, and zero demand equals zero value, and uh, zero uh, supply and infinite demand equals infinite value. So if you make more houses, or everyone's house comes down in value. And that's why you cannot uh, have politicians who will make more housing. Um, so they, they divest from uh, state stock, and they use the planning system to prevent the construction of new housing. Uh, the financial sector responds to this by issuing two types of finance, uh, short-term finance for construction, uh, which puts developers under such immense pressure that they are forced to sell uh, on completion. That's why 99.96% uh, of all housing in the UK is built to sell. Um, and they issue long-term mortgages for the family. So the, the, there's no real uh, option in the marketplace for consumers. They have either a predatory rental market or they have uh, the mortgage. And so, of course, they go for the mortgage. Um, this is what I would describe as the ownership loop because it, it's, it's an almost impossible loop to break. And unfortunately, it drives a feedback uh, loop within the system of declining supply and rising prices. That's, that's literally what the mortgage is supposed to do. So the housing crisis is not an accident. That's, 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 it's functioning properly. Um, and you, as you can see in the US and UK, uh, well, since an arbitrary date, which is 76. Um, but this is only really true, I should say, in democracies where more than 50% of the demographic have a mortgage. And I do think it is interesting that probably by the end of the decade or sometime in the 2030s, um, we will see that uh, fall below 50%. You can see it started to fall for the first time uh, in, in, ever. Um, and um, when you have more than 50% of, of voters who don't own a mortgage, you may get a rather different system that comes out of it. Of course, housing is uh, hugely, this entire industry of mortgage-backed homes is, uh, in, is terribly damaging to the planet. Uh, but uh, because uh, we're so short on time, I do not have time to say more about that right now. Um, as you're aware, I, I own the statement, Form Follows Finance. I have a trademark on that. Um, and. Uh, so that's the approach which I take, that's the methodology that I, I take to uh, this uh, presentation. Um, if the existing system is designed to produce low supply at a high price, and it's very capex sensitive, what this means, capital expenditure is the amount that things cost. So they're very, uh, it's a system which is very much geared towards um, the price of construction. Uh, what's the opposite of that? The opposite is a system which generates high supply at a low price, um, and which is OPEX sensitive, so it's operational expenditure, which means it's much more concerned with how much it costs to run, how much it costs to maintain. These are, these are the systems that I'm interested in. So here is the solution to the housing crisis. I've never heard anyone give a better one, um, I, and the entire purpose of me giving this presentation is to publicly present this idea. So I hope you like it. Uh, it's not currently viable, uh, but I, I'm working on that. Um, so uh, here's the scenario. You, you, you make a not-for-profit development and operations company, right? Not-for-profit, okay, already pretty unusual. Then you find an ultra-high net worth individual 
who will give you money for the construction interest-free. Uh, well, why would they do that? I do believe that we are in a uh, period, I mean, it is the case statistically within this audience that most of you don't believe that billionaires should exist. Uh, more than 70% uh, of the UK uh, electorate now believe that. Uh, so there's a, a rising skepticism about extreme wealth inequality and why, why very rich people exist. Um, I do think that in coming decades, there will be increasing pressure for those people to justify their social function. And so there are quite an increasing number of philanthropists amongst them. If you know an ultra high net worth individual who wants to get into post-capitalist housing, please reach out to me through the social media channel of your choice. Uh, so this uh, not-for-profit uh, development and operations company, uh, of course, because it hasn't paid a development loan, uh, which is very expensive, it's already saved 9% on the cost of the house. So it builds the housing asset, which is a nice way of referring to a home. And simultaneously to this, you establish an ESG fund. ESG uh, stands for Environment, uh, so Social, and Governance Capital. Um, it's basically ethical capital, sometimes called green money. It's a $50 trillion sector. One in five assets globally are now ESG assets. And they come with much higher, um, I mean, it's actually, it's a bit of a wild west, this, uh, this uh, sector. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you establish an ESG fund which goes out to the ESG markets and raises a fixed rate bond with a linear equity return. Now, this is quite important because a fixed rate bond at say 5% for 30 years is not dissimilar from a fixed rate mortgage. But as you're probably aware, in a mortgage, the equity curve is, uh, is not linear, um, which means that the very first payment is mostly interest and your very last payment is almost entirely capital. A, a linear grade of equity return would mean that if you're paying over 30 years, you get 3.3% of equity return every single year consistently. And it's actually, it doesn't affect the amount of interest that is paid in total. It's a purely, uh, uh, it has a different function. So the ESG fund on completion of the housing asset buys the house. There's no risk for them because they haven't assumed the risk of building the uh, property. And um, of course the, the housing asset to them is at 20% less than its market value because they're buying it at cost. They're not buying it uh, at market rate. They then pay the money back to the ultra high net worth individual and the residents pay the ESG fund, the, the capital investment plus interest. And every year that they do that, 3.3% of the building comes back into ownership of the house itself, and that is paid out as uh, an equity instrument to the resident. So that's it, that's, that's how you do it. That's the financial model for post-capitalist housing. And if I have $5 million, I will make it, and then other people can copy it. The, exactly like mortgages, it's not supposed to be proprietary, uh, it's supposed to be a generalized model which can easily be imitated. That's what it means to make a, 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 a main, uh, mainstream, uh, you know, popular alternative. So the effect of this is to more or less make a fixed rate collective mortgage at 65% market value. Uh, the residents get equity accrual uh, through this secondary instrument and they also have tenure security and an alternative form of ownership. But what about OPEX longevity and maintenance? I could not hear anyone in the room say. Well, this is the question, right? So what, what actually does this type of architecture look like? Um, it's not a diagram, obviously. It needs to be a building. So as I said, I've done uh, 10 projects in this series. It's uh, remarkable to me that at the age of 25, I set about doing a 10-year project. I don't know why I thought that was a good idea, but I've done diligently one project every year for 10 years. This is the final project in the series. There is no more to come after this. I've concluded the experiment, um, and, and it is what it is. Anyway, you... I'll just roll through this. So the toilet stack leads into a uh, anaerobic uh, bioreactor, which produces a biogas, which under a compressor feeds a combi boiler, and that's how you get free hot water for the whole building, um, for your baths, for your washing machines, for your uh, cooking. The gray water out of those systems is captured and is uh, run through a biolan um, uh, gray water filter, uh, which is a combination of uh, uh, microbial and uh, sand filters, <laughs> which goes into a primary holding tank, which is also fed by water, rainwater from the roof. Um, this is filtered on site and stored in collapsible bladders, which is important because you don't want air in there, because you don't want bacterial buildup, and this provides you with cold water. 
Um, there is, of course, uh, ventilation for cooking, uh, but generally the whole system operates using heat pumps as part of a passive house system in order to reduce your energy uh, consumption. Uh, and of course, the uh, fresh air at the same temperature is fed back through a ducting system. Um, there is also a passive cooling system with a ventilation uh, duct at ground level, which runs into a uh, thermal uh, uh, heat sink. Uh, there's corrugated fins that the air moves through. This is what the basement looks like. This is what the water bladder and basement uh, technical layer looks like. That's what that looks like. Uh, the system on top of it is built very simply using um, uncut uh, and hung uh, wall panels. So the purpose of this is uh, you can remove any section of wall. Uh, none of it needs to be painted. You're constantly thinking about how you can reduce maintenance within the building. Um, the, the, the primary construction material, probably some of you, I'm imagining some of you are architects. Uh, if not, this would be a very boring presentation, but um, this is an eco cocoon uh, product, which you may be aware of. It's a, a high density thatch structural panel. Uh, that's, that's the primary uh, structure. Uh, that's the glazing, that's the waterproof membrane, and there is a hung uh, panel system on the outside and a uh, shaded uh, uh, system. And, and that's it. It's, it's not, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to really nail the Photoshop, but I think you get <laughs> the idea. Um, Sam says it's aesthetically very brutal, but I think I should say with regards to that, that it's really important. Like, if you look on my Instagram, you know, I've designed other things that have not been built, and I can design. Sometimes I choose not to. Um, and in this instance, the purpose of this was to produce a building. There were two things. One was it's an experiment in circular economy design. So you're really much more interested in building systems and building construction and assembly uh, much more than you are in uh, and avoiding bespokes. So everything is uh, off the peg. There's really no... Uh, what you would describe as uh, design innovation within this. But the other thing is that when I started, I was very opposed to um, aesthetic expression in the facade of buildings for two reasons. One is uh, form follows function, exposes your life uh, to people. Uh, they see where you live and how you live, and I'm not interested in that. And the other is, uh, I was very interested in the way in which facades had become instruments of speculative wealth. So I was looking for ways to make the least attractive, least articulate, least aesthetic facade. And uh, 10 years later, this is, well, well you see what it is. Anyway, 70% less electricity, 90% less water, 100% less fossil fuels, 65% uh, less rent, 60% less utility costs. So that's the vibe. It's just a normal suburban building that looks a bit like an electricity substation. <laughs> Inside, uh, a very straightforward, very, very simple, very simple plan. Um, you know, uh, very, very difficult to make sure that everything works in, in whole modules. There, you know, you, there's, there's zero waste in this building. Um, every, uh, every element that you order is used in its entirety. Um, including down to, to floorboards. Uh, there are no nails in the building. It's all screwed together. There's no glue or adhesive. There are no fossil fuel components apart from window gaskets, which we don't currently have the ability to replace. Um, so that's, that's, that's what you get. As you can see, it's, it's a plan which attempts to be n as non-prescriptive as possible in its functional layout. It tries not to make assumptions about family structure or other types of domestic arrangement um, and is otherwise a very straightforward uh, building. Um, and that's the conclusion of 10 years, which began with this kind of gold tower and which has rolled through a variety of other unrealizable, with varying degrees of realism. This was a project which I ran for a number of years called Real Homes, which was my attempt to finance uh, this uh, post-capitalist housing, but I've not been successful in that currently, and so I must think again about my approach. And we are now out of time, so I thank you very much. <laughs>